Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's lecture. It's a full house tonight, so we're very grateful to have everybody here with us tonight, despite the, the raindrops. Um, I'd like to open up this lecture by talking about our upcoming event at the AIA, Center for Architecture for October. Um, we're going to have a very special um, exhibition and event lined up for celebrating the 50th anniversary of our interior design department. And um, for that, you could go onto the AIA website, but just to give you some highlights, where it's going to take place, the speaking panels are going to take place on October 19th, which is a Thursday. And um, we're going to have a talk called Architecture, Interior Design, Engineering, and Construction at the Crossroads of Digital Processes and Information Technologies. And that's going to be presented by um, Asley Burgess. And we're going to have a second session that day, gaming and entertainment, tech and architecture, engineering, and construction, graphics, 3D gaming, environments, virtual and augmented reality video, and photography tools, not to be missed. Um, presenter is Lucas Richmond. And we're also going to have an evening keynote presentation panel um, guided by Robert Allen, who is um, part of our interior design department. And other keynote speakers, including Adam Tihani, Giorgio Baruso, and Lauren Adams. And um, we welcome you to uh, go and see the exhibition that will be also presented at that time by um, Franco Perini, who's coming from Italy. And he, Perini and Antonino Saggio will speak um, next Friday, the 20th of October, at the AOB, Auditorium on Broadway. So you will be receiving an invite for that via email that you should register RSVP as soon as possible so you can reserve your seats. Um, and um, they're going to be speaking on um, in the place of drawing technology and creative processes. And the exhibition is called In the Space of Drawing, Reason and Imagination. The opening reception for the exhibition is on October 16th. So that is in a few days. Um, hopefully, you will be able to go to the AIA and be part of that event. Um, tonight's lecture is, um, is being given by one of our uh, longtime uh, honorable faculty members, um, Michael Schwarting, who's been in NYIT for a very long time. And I would like to invite our colleague, uh, Jonathan Friedman, to introduce him for us. So please welcome. Professor Jonathan Friedman. Thanks, Naomi. Did that work? Yeah. Um, uh, Dean Perbellini had a meeting tonight, so she could not be here to make the introduction. And I am indeed honored to be able to do this uh, for my colleague and a good friend, uh, John Michael Schwarting. Uh, John is, uh, or Michael, as the case may be, is uh, the consummate professional. Uh, you have lots of documentation, but his published work from a, a notable loft conversion, which was just about a half century ago, uh, to a more recent uh, mixed-use project that brilliantly turns the corner, has set a standard that many of the rest of us seek to follow for thoughtful, competent, and beautiful design that is built. Uh, he's done plans uh, for Port Jefferson, including harbor, station, town revitalization. And so they, he truly is a practicing urban designer and urbanist. He is also uh, the consummate amateur in the sense of loving what he learns and does and discovers. And from the Rome Prize that he won as America's most promising architectural student in 1970, along with Colin Rowe, who won it that year. And we have, among other distinguished guests here, at least one other uh, Rome Prize laureate. Uh, Todd Williams is here with us tonight. And we're honored to have him and all of you. Um, to his careful and loving restoration of the Illuminaire House in 1987, or since 1987, uh, which among other things led to an interview with Susan Stanberg. How many architects can claim that? To his dedication to teaching advanced and graduate level architecture and urban design, and indeed essentially the founder of the graduate program in urban and regional design here at NYIT. Uh, 
he has been in the midst of things since his time with the Cornell gang, which included uh, Colin Rowe, Fred Coder, uh, Graham Shane, Michael Dennis, and uh, even, I guess, at the tail end, uh, people like Anthony Rocanova, who is here with us tonight, and with his students, they came all the way from Lexington, Kentucky, to hear this speech, so uh, the word is out. Uh, his years at the crucial moment with Richard Meyer as one of the Richard Meyer and Associates Associates and as the essential presence on our faculty since the early 1980s. We are privileged to learn of his, uh, now his, perhaps his most abiding love and design, the form and evolution of urban form through the examples of his beloved city of Rome. Michael's been an essential and vital presence uh, in bringing and keeping our school at national and international levels of attention and relevance. Uh, and this book, that you see the, uh, cover of there, uh, nearly 50 years in the making, um, uh, with its deep insights, beautiful drawings, graphics, layout, and design, and the most effective use of the uh, uh, font Arial that I've seen in a long time, is an example of consummate towering skill and dedication. Uh, we are indeed grateful that Professor Schwarting and architect Schwarting has come to speak to us tonight to show us Rome and architectural ideas in their formation and transformation. Tonight he will share this beautiful book and sign them afterwards at the end of the evening and his body of thoughts, ideas, and visions. He will share with us this really towering achievement. It is a big deal and a special time. See you in a tree indeed. So here please welcome John Michael Schwarting. Thank you, Jonathan, too much. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy to be here tonight talking about one of the things that has been consuming me for an awful long time. And I've tried to uh, share that passion uh, with an awful lot of students. So this is uh, in some ways dedicated to, uh, to people who worked and studied with me and produced a lot of important information that's that's in this book. Uh, I think, uh, I guess, uh, NYIT, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, for uh, giving me all these years of time to teach and, uh, and continue to work on this book. As I've constantly said, it's a lot easier to uh, draw than it is to write, at least for me. And I think most architects have that same uh, situation. So um, actually, I have to. Um, there's no mouse here. I, I have to find a way to get back. Uh, OK. Good. Um, and I'm going to read some parts of this because I want to be uh, kind of hold to my message here. Uh, in, in sort of critical parts, but uh, I also want uh, particularly to share uh, the visual aspects of, of the book. Uh, um, I've been working on this uh, book in various ways since I was at the American Academy in Rome, uh, Jonathan had mentioned, and also in my graduate uh, studies at Cornell with uh, Professor Colin Rowe. Um, in school, in my time, and it still, I think, persists, um, uh, in the writing of architectural history, uh, buildings were presented in pure isolation. Uh, those fantastic Alinari, Italian Alinari uh, photographs used by historians that even corrected the perspective so that it was, uh, uh, so they were shown completely isolated in their, um, uh, in their isolated form. Uh, I, in Rome, I found that these buildings were in complex and interesting urban settings. And, with further observation and analysis, the design decisions seem to be made in relation to contextual conditions. So I studied this when I was at the American Academy. Uh, I wrote an article, uh, The Lesson of Rome, uh, in Harvard Review, 
uh, after Le Corbusier's uh, chapter title. Uh, and uh, that began the beginning of uh, uh, the work that uh, is concluded in this, in this book. Uh, uh, when I started teaching, I took, uh, I was first teaching at uh, Cooper Union and then also at Columbia. I took students from Columbia University to Rome on summer programs and for quite a few years worked on observation, recording, and analysis uh, projects with the students on this issue of uh, buildings in their context. Uh, I accumulated a beautiful collection of ink on mylar drawings, a thing of the past, um, of urban plans, and in particular sections uh, that didn't exist anywhere, uh, revealing, I think, extraordinary relationships between buildings and the city. So one purpose of the book is to share this amazing documentation and the ideas that I think are embedded in them. On the other hand, through my learning at uh, Cornell and with the uh, Colin Rowe uh, Urban Design Program and in Rome, I developed some theory about the potential processes of urban designing. I have to say that I'm deeply indebted to Colin uh, for this, and I have to say that it's, he started me on my way uh, to uh, this uh, endless pursuit. Uh, the book uh, and this presentation kind of goes from the general to the specific and from very general ideas about urban design to specific case studies in relation between uh, urban buildings and their context. Uh, I begin with the word idea and some relation to Palato's discussion of idea as an ideal and its relationship to things which are imperfect examples of it. Ideal is defined in the dictionary as a concept of what is perfect, existing in the imagination, desirable or perfect, but not likely to become reality. So the dialectical opposite of ideal is the real, um, the real existing in things, not imagined. Uh, real ideas are defined, again, from the dictionary as derived from sensation and reflection and not imagined or proposed knowledge directed or guided by experience without the knowledge of principles. Uh, there is this often discussed dialectical relationship between Plato's idealism and Aristotle's empiricism, which is sort of fundamental to uh, uh, my early uh, chapters. Uh, the notion of the ideal as something imagined is relatable to the concept of utopia and again from the dictionary, an imagined place or state of things where everything is perfect. It employs the imaginary to project the ideal, a perfect social, legal, and political system or place, state, or condition. In contrast to ideal, a utopia can enter into the realm of the physical, uh, of architecture, or the urban. A utopian proposition is thus quite different from an ideal notion in a significant way, it is an imagined reality. And I, uh, I'd like to uh, kind of bring that around with a, a favorite quote of mine from Lewis Mumford, who in 1922 wrote a book, The Story of Utopias, Utopia, and says, quote, almost every utopia is an implicit criticism of the civilization that served as its background. Likewise, it is an attempt to uncover potentialities that the existing institutions either ignored or buried beneath the ancient crust of custom and habit. They most often indict existing society by showing alternatives, sensing both intolerable conditions and enormous possibilities. Uh, that's a, I like that quote. Um, in uh, 1959, Colin Rowe published an article, The Architecture of Utopia, um, and in it he stated, and I quote from Colin, Architecture serves practical ends. It is subjected to use, but it also is shaped by ideas and fantasies. Its rationale is cosmic and metaphysical, and here, of course, lay its particular ability to impose itself on the mind. Uh, Colin also, in that article and uh, in following years, expressed interest in uh, Karl Mannheim's uh, 1937 book, Ideology and Utopia. Um, whose definition of utopia was that, another quote, only those orientations transcending reality will be referred to us as a utopian, 
which when they pass over into conduct, tend to shatter partly or wholly the order of things prevailing at the time. So w one of the issues of utopianism is its desire to replace an existing presumed reality with another. A, a critique of, of utopian propositions is that they can't simultaneously be real and ideal. And again, I quote from uh, Colin Rowe, uh, it may instruct, civilize, and even edify the political society that is exposed to it. It may do all this, but for all of that, it cannot become alive. It cannot, that is, become the society which it changes, and it cannot, therefore, change itself. A complex uh, a tangle of uh, thoughts there. Uh, however, I think from Mannheim, uh, Mannheim expressed a dialectical relationship with reality where a utopian proposition um, uh, can achieve a reconciliation on another level of truth requiring a reevaluation or redefinition of itself. It has an effect. It is changed by its acceptance. This responds to a dynamic rather than static notion of utopia. And this idea is critical to my theory. My argument is, is quite simple. In the Renaissance, uh, architects were inventing ideal cities, utopias, but working in the existing medieval city. They worked with the dialectic of developing the ideal city, the ideal piazza, church, or palazzo on the one hand, and instead of tearing down the medieval city or building new ones elsewhere on open land, as I will actually discuss at the end, um, they sought ways to transform the existing city uh, by insinuating uh, the ideal, the new city, into it. And uh, I think my last quote, uh, from Spiro Kostov, uh, who I, again, I like this quote, uh, said, ideal schemes for perfect overall forms stayed in treatises. Reality forced a respect for built things as long as they were serviceable, as long as they could be kept standing. Urban stock was not casually expendable, so the new style had to rely on exemplary uh, accent to make its point. I think uh, we should uh, continue to think about uh, that issue. So in the Middle Ages, theory grew out of practice, but in the Renaissance, practice grew out of a critical theory. The interest in antiquity, in Plato and Vitruvius, and their particular descriptions of the ideal city led many Renaissance architects to describe or draw ideal schemes. Verbal descriptions by Alberti and Filaretti discuss or imply the society that was to inhabit these cities. Uh, Sforzinda of Filaretti, which is up on the upper right, um, and uh, the Fra Gicando's image, which is next to it. This is actually a drawing, which you could see was on the cover of the book that existed this way, and I put three more of it around it to make it whole. Um, uh, were all the descriptions of, uh, of an ideal um, city. Francesco Di Giorgio, Scamazzi's Fortified Cities, which you can see here too, for different uh, topographies, and street scenes by architects Peruzzi, Sirolio, and the painter Piero della Francesca uh, created a theoretical body of proposals that reflected a new conception of urban order and space. These ideal city diagrams argued for an understanding of the whole and the interrelation of the parts to themselves and to the whole, as Alberti, and Leonardo da Vinci and Palladio all paraphrased uh, Vitruvius. So these three uh, paintings, I think, are a kind of synthesis of, um, uh, of an ideal city with its uh, Renaissance components. The ideal church, the ideal piazza, the ideal palazzo um, reoccurs, and at times also an important reference to antiquity that could um, serve also as uh, the renascimento, the rebirth. So uh, in my book, I trace um, the, the kind of ideal uh, piazza and church and palazzo and its uh, sort of transform transformations, mostly from uh, references to, uh, to Roman uh, antiquity. So these are uh, a variety of uh, of Renaissance piazzas uh, derived from uh, Vitruvius's description of the 
of the Forum. The Renaissance Church is more obvious, and uh, Rudolf Wittkover beautifully talks about the, um, the perfection of uh, uh, proportions and so forth in the, in the ideal church, which had some difficulty functioning, probably. Or the ideal palazzo, which again is influenced by um, things like the, uh, the Roman house, but in uh, Fran Francesco de Giorgio's uh, kind of little diagrams of the kind of perfect form um, uh, formulations of, of the palazzo. And the facades, which again, not only uh, are representing uh, a, a certain stylistic uh, interest, but also the perfection of, of uh, geometry and proportion. So uh, I'll take you on a little journey through the book. One of the first important things that I think I ha have to note is how, who designed all these uh, urban interventions. And Rome is uh, distinctly different from other places because almost all the, the issues that I investigated were done by the papacy, by a succession of popes going to uh, Nicola V uh, in the early 1400s all the way to um, uh, Sixth V uh, in the around 1600 and, and, and even beyond. So I traced um, the kind of uh, progressive developments of the of the Pope's interventions, which are more complex than are often uh, revealed. And then I, um, in my, uh, before the case studies, I, I talk about uh, Rome as an ideal city. And uh, how could it be the ideal city that was in the diagrams that I showed you, where the church is in the center, the perfect piazza, the streets radiate out, um, and do we get uh, the square and the circle and so forth in it? And how do they do that in Rome? Because the main church is St. Peter's across the, the Tiber River um, uh, and, and not anywhere near the center of the city. Uh, but in the Renaissance, this is a Duperac uh, uh, engraving of uh, actually around the High Renaissance, 1550s, uh, we get uh, the operations of the uh, Renaissance uh, architects in the Campo Marzio area, the area that was uh, continued to uh, exist during the Middle Ages when the rest of the city was taken down by the, at the end of the Roman uh, uh, time. So what the Renaissance architects tried to do, and this is my um, argument, although others have made very similar ones, is uh, to put St. Peter's into the middle of the city, and uh, which is a conceptual um, uh, strategy, a set of strategies, one of which was to um, take the medieval streets and interweave them with one another so that there could be some continuity from St. Peter's all the way to the Roman Forum, uh, the Capitoline Hill, uh, and uh, the Roman monuments uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, the old center of the city. This is a, um, a kind of axonometric diagram, and I'll take you through some of these projects, starting with St. Peter's. Let me go back for just a second and say that um, if you use your imagination a little bit and think of this as an ideal city that someone sat on, uh, that it kind of got rumpled up and it's a, it's a bit of a mess. Uh, but nevertheless, somewhere in there, you can see concentric and radiating patterns. They're, they're all there and they all seem to come from around this point. Um, and uh, so that's a, a critical area to trace. And what I'll uh, show you in uh, the drawings, these wonderful drawings that uh, students made in my, my analytical thinking was um, to uh, look at St. Peter's, the crossing at the Castello San Angelo, which was Hadrian's tomb, across the river, the development of the Piazza di Ponte and the Trident Street uh, sequence that spreads itself out till it covers a number of important things in the city. I mentioned the uh, Roman Forum, which is down here, the Teatro Marcello, the Pantheon, 
as ancient artifacts and the Piazza Navona, but also as this is happening, the Renaissance uh, aristocracy is building palazzos like Farnese and Cancelleria um, in this network, which was also used by the papacy in the procession of, uh, of uh, a new pope, which would start at San Giovanni in Laterano, which we'll get to, go to, the, um, to St. Peter's for the, uh, uh, the, the coronation. Uh, so this network was an uh, incredibly important part of, uh, of uh, church uh, events, not only that uh, when a new pope was uh, chosen, but lots of different pageants which uh, have uh, kind of disappeared over time but were very prominent and prevalent in the city. So the book, uh, uh, the first four chapters, uh, I just explained all of that to you. Um, and, uh, and the last one, which is the big one, um, is, are the case studies. And I took each case study and I took certain things that I repeated over and over again. A figure ground drawing, because I went to Cornell. Um, and uh, I've made all my students make figure rounds, so they know what I'm talking about. Um, and uh, uh, some key uh, illustrations, some photographs of my own occasionally. Giuseppe Vazzi engravings, um, which were important uh, documents because he so thoroughly looked at the city, so I consistently chose those. And then, uh, in each case, a set of transformational diagrams going from the ideal to the real. And I, I don't know why I chose four steps, but um, somehow that happened, and I stuck to it. But you can see with St. Peter's Church in the center of the radiating city, church on the edge of the piazza, the piazza expanding all the way down to the Castello San Angelo, crossing the bridge, the trident of streets going out into the, the urban fabric. And then uh, in each case, uh, well, I have a, a, a little description. I tried to not get too involved in the history, but I, I, I documented the critical history of who did what and, and uh, when. Uh, but I also tried to do some architectural uh, spatial analysis, getting more down into the scale of the buildings and the spaces. Uh, so it goes, and in some cases also a kind of historical uh, transformation of time, St. Peter's as it grew at, at critical moments. So this is uh, in the book, the kind of uh, uh, first two pages of each project. And then uh, the next two pages are a plan drawn ink on mylar, um, throughout the 70s by my students. Um, very carefully uh, made drawings, which uh, we had to kind of do all the calculation in Rome and the, when we were there for several weeks and then they would draw them back uh, at school in Columbia. And um, as I said, I think more importantly, these sections. So here's a section going through uh, Bernini's um, uh, arms right through here and then shifting over and going through the Belvedere and then also up the middle through the through the church and it's quite interesting and sort of astonishing the the scale shifts and stuff that you don't quite notice when you're there this is the uh, Capitoline Hill and again similar things some important uh, before and after uh, Michelangelo's uh, Piazza the figure ground, which uh, was critical because it uh, tried to uh, demonstrate the front side towards St. Peter's and the back side towards the Forum. And uh, this, the transformational diagrams from simple to the real, again, a kind of historical comparison and so forth. But again, the kind of exciting parts that came out I think while we were doing these over the summers were these uh, sections, section through uh, the piazza and up through the stairs and the um, senatorio. And in some cases, well, they, the students got even more ambitious and made these beautiful um, exonometrics. So the second uh, intervention that I discuss is not only is there a sense of radiating uh, streets that come from the Piazza di Ponte and what I would say is the uh, altar and the center of St. Peter's kind of 
dragged out through here and into the, into the city. Um, but also there's a, a sort of concentric structure that starts with the kind of uh, interesting characteristics of the Tiber River that bends elaborately at St. Peter's. So it goes from the river back to the river and uh, structures again a kind of orientation back to um, St. Peter's. So we get another complement of an ideal city. And those, go back there a second, uh, are made by uh, mostly Renaissance interventions, the Palazzo Farnese, the Conciliaria, um, the Palazzo Massimo, which is kind of hiding over here, the, the Piazza Navona with the uh, Baroque Church of San Annese uh, by uh, Borromini. So we go, um, we get this uh, kind of loop that's made, and I, I've drawn it sort of carefully over there. And again, the going through the the uh, the process, the the figure ground, the vasi drawings, the sometimes my photographs, because I was sort of interested in very specific things like the elaborate scale shift that um, you, again you might hardly notice, or the fact that the cornice when you're going down this street, uh, seems to complete the street space. Um, so interesting uh, visual things. And my transformations from, from ideal to real, and my architectural uh, uh, fantasies of, of formal organization. The plan, um, and the, they look a lot better in the book than, it, than it's looking to me on the screen here. But uh, the, the, a, a wonderful section through the, the uh, Piazza Farnese into the Cortile, the Garden, and the Tiber River. The Conchilaria, which is just up from Farnese. Um, and again, I think one of my, my favorite facades, so I probably overanalyzed that one. Um, and uh, views and so forth. So you can kind of see the, the typical pattern, but this is all plugged into that uh, concentric diagram to, um, uh, to see the literal pieces. And just for instance, um, uh, when you come up from the uh, uh, Palazzo Farnese, which is this street, and you come to this end and you go around there and you're in the Piazza Navona, uh, off to the side is the long, thin, forum-like space of the Conchilaria. And the Conchilaria has two pieces, a courtyard and a church. The court, you say, well, why, where, how did you figure out where to put them? When you're walking up this street and you look this way, you can see through the door, it's uh, kind of up there, that I'm standing right in that space. And you can look back and see through the door if the French would ever open the, uh, the Farnese. Um, uh, you could see both ways um, and make the, that kind of connection, which helps, uh, I think, kind of conceptually, maybe not, maybe not so literally, the notion of this uh, concentric organization. And finally, the, the Piazza Navona, uh, which was a found object. Uh, Mussolini wanted to put a road through here, and they found that it was, in fact, it wasn't until then that they found that it was uh, a Roman circus. But uh, uh, Bernini had added to it, uh, Borromini had added to it, and uh, it becomes a a critical linkage in this, uh, this sequence. And uh, those of you who are, have gone the last couple summers to Rome, the, you see where you were at about uh, 11 o'clock on one of the mornings coming from St. Peter's and following this route. Interesting, the kind of uh, the facades of, uh, uh, of the uh, Piazza Navona which are all pretty idiosyncratic, except for uh, Palazzo Pamphile. And interestingly, the, the kind of section of the church, San Inese, with the section of the space. Then my next um, pursuit, and this is following these, the, pretty much the papal um, uh, events, the moves that were made. The, the papacy went back on the hills, um, reconnected the aqueducts so that it could be inhabited again, and um, connected a pilgrimage route to the churches that were done in the early, when the Christianity was uh, forbidden in Rome and were on the outside, near the walls and so forth, that had to be in some way connected back into uh, some relationship 
with St. Peter's. So now my um, ideal city is even more kind of wrinkled up, but uh, nevertheless, from St. Peter's, we, we start with the little trident, and from there can go over to these critical churches, Santa Maria del Popolo uh, and the Piazza del Popolo, Santa Trinita, Spanish Steps, uh, down the hill to the, uh, 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 the uh, piazza for uh, the uh, Palazzo Barberini, and then up the hill to, I'm, I can f feel the hills. <laughs> they don't show in the drawings. Up the hill to the Quattro Fontana, down the hill and up the hill to Santa Maria Maggiore, and then off to uh, the San Giovanni in Laterano and Santa Croce in Jerusalem. And the, I always put the Colosseum in there because Sixtus V wanted to convert the Colosseum into a wool factory. So it was a, it was a critical part of the kind of economic strategy of Sixtus V's planning, which took on a, an awful lot of this diagram and the same sequence. The Piazza del Popolo, critical images, my little transformation drawings, and uh, analysis of the spaces. The one, I, I tend to think the earlier Piazza del Popolo is better than the later one, except for this little piece that uh, Velladier did of connecting the hill to the river across it. So there's I've piled everything I could find by looking at these things for years and years. But here's the, the hill that Vladier uh, terraced down to the piazza uh, and a section through the stepping of that hill out to the river where a student has a little fish over here. The Spanish steps, there's 137 of them. I count them every time I go with the students. And it always comes out the same. Um, uh, it's a lot of steps, but it's wonderful experience. Now, that was the idea of the design, how to make the difficult enjoyable. Um, to get the church into the sequence from Santa Maria del Popolo and going off to Santa Maria Maggiore. So there had to be a, a kind of a shear, uh, not only in plan, but also in section. the sections through this which were quite astonishing for the student to draw all the bushes and stuff. It's a piazza that has is very ill-defined on its sides but uh, very coherent in its um, uh, sequence. Santa Maria Maggiore which was uh, Sixth of the Fifth church so he wanted it uh, f uh, standing in isolation which made it uh, a little bit difficult mostly because the church was facing away from the city. This is uh, the sequence coming from Santa Maria del Popolo. So the architects were very clever. They put the obelisk, which Sixth V put in front of most of these uh, pilgrimage churches on the route at the back side, opened up the doors to the nave uh, in the aisles and coming into the nave so you could come uh, from both sides into the church. All this is a fantastic kind of architectural invention, but it's coming from a need to reconcile its relationship to uh, to the city, um, trying to make this sense of the ideal, but very carefully w relating to and working with the the real, making the real much more interesting by and large than the ideal. So, um, again, quite elaborate. Um, uh, drawings of the sections of Santa Maria Maggiore, and then to the end, uh, San Giovanni and Laterano, which also had the problem that it's facing, this is the southern wall of the city. We started at Piazza del Popolo, the northern wall, so we've come across the whole uh, city of, uh, within the Aurelian wall, and uh, uh, this is facing sideways, so they had to get an entrance coming from Santa Maria Maggiore, which is in this direction. The obelisk is here. The side transept becomes a, a porch um, and an entry into the uh, sort of daily uh, altar at this point for the major altar crossing it. So there's two spatial events, kind of high and uh, daily happening, um, beautifully kind of knit together. Uh, I haven't been mentioning those, but uh, I'm sure you'll 
you've seen them along the way, and uh, the interesting sections, like, is that real? <laughs> That's the facade, the backside of the facade that was put onto this uh, San Giovanni in Laterano. Okay. Um, so why did I do all this? Um, uh, Rome, urban formation and transformation is foremost an idea for the practice of making urban design. It proposes a methodology that involves the dialectical process or discourse between ideal and utopian thinking and real making or uh, development within the existing city. As such, it implicitly argues for a utopian proposition about contemporary urbanism that may be formulated as a critique or a rejection of the problems of the present ideological beliefs as evidenced in the cultural, cultural social, economic, and political, and physical conditions. Uh, we need to understand and analyze this and to step outside of existing conditions to envision a more perfect situation. This dream can be realized, but not literally, for several reasons. For one, it requires the removal of the existing, which has obvious impossibilities or terrible consequences. There have been two ideas proposed since the 19th century, which still prevail today, uh, tearing down the existing city or building a new replacement outside of it, that have uh, been continuously pursued in urban design and, as I say, I think continue today. Uh, on the one hand uh, is the kind of sequence from CIAM to Team 10 to our urban renewal program in the US to uh, the deconstruction movement and I would say even today in what I uh, have called uh, narcissistic urbanism, um, have argued for insisting um, new urban ideas into this historical city until it potentially wipes it all out and replaces it with something new. We're still doing that. Uh, on the other hand, from Ebenezer Howard to new urbanism, uh, the historical city was to be abandoned for the new town or the garden city. Both seek to replace the existing city by takeover or abandonment. Another reason for not insisting on a literal realization of utopia is that we have learned from the past experience that it can lead to totalitarian condition, Plato's Republic, Hitler's Nazi Germany, or Stalin's Soviet Union. Karl Popper, I think, uh, carefully uh, talks about that in his Open Society and Its Enemies. Alternatively, in the dialect proposed, the ideal has to be insinuated into the existing in such a way as both maintain the essential continuity of the, with the past and to transform the existing into a more appropriate contemporary city condition. The theory of contextualism is concerned with transforming the existing city into a contemporary functioning city by understanding through analysis the existing physical context in order to build on and transform its structure also to be progressive by analyzing and transforming the present ideological conditions, social, cultural, economic, and political context, and postulating a better world, a utopia, and transforming that into real or realizable proposals. If one interprets ideal proposals or utopias as diagrams, which are not intended to be built, but rather to, as uh, Colin Rose said, instruct, civilize, and edify the normal growth change and transformation processes of the city, then the effects of these proposals can be viewed in relation to the problem of the existing city and create a transformed new city growing from the old. Thank you. Maybe because I, th I think I have just a few moments. Um, I've got a few more special prizes for you. I just, I'll kind of go quickly. Some of my favorites that didn't fit into the lecture so well. Um, uh, the Palazzo Borghese, which is uh, this guy over here, which uh, if you compare it to the Palazzo Farnese, which uh, uh, Colin Rowe has done, this is a, a kind of wrinkled up ideal palazzo that does so many uh, wonderful things in its context. One of which, as we've been I was just talking this last few weeks with my students, uh, becomes a chameleon, an, an interesting analogy, I think. 
and the student drawings, the sections again that are so kind of wonderful, and this uh, great axonometric, which is a lot better in the book than it's showing up on me. Uh, the Palazzo Barberini, which um, it, it has to be uncovered very carefully because it's uh, been abused in the way one enters it and so forth, but it all starts in the, uh, in the piazza, which is at the bottom of the hill, and there's a kind of sacred way, walk, procession, walks its way up to the front of it, through it, to the back of it, and around and into it, uh, with Bernini and Borromini playing off of one another in, in great ways. And again, the, the kind of fantastic student drawings. Or one of my favorite uh, demonstrations of this is that this drawing doesn't exist anywhere. They never put Borromini's church, which is named after the Quattro Fontana, into a plan with the Quattro Fontana. So uh, this is the sixth is the fifth move with the Domenico Fontana um, proposing the space. Borromini does the church and spends a lot of attention to um, where this fountain is. And in fact, I suggest it, it creates the oval and the courtyard sequence from from the outside into the inside. Beautiful sections. Those exist in a lot of places. But if you look in uh, books of Borromini's uh, drawings, well, his sketches, there's just a lot of lines all over the place right around that fountain. So he was, it's pretty clear he was working that out somehow. Uh, San Ignacio, a church by Carlo Maderno, and then more than 100 years later, a piazza by Raguzzini, which has um, this uh, beautiful response uh, of spaces on the outside that relate to, and I drew this over and over again, the kind of uh, relationships. I just dragged the church out into the piazza in different ways, and also in section. The, the Raguzzini buildings line up with the entablature inside the church. Wonderful drawing. And the last one, uh, the little church of Santa Maria della Pace, here's the Gazza Navona. Uh, the, the route coming from the, the strands that radiate from the Piazza di Ponte um, to uh, a space, a church that was octagonal, that was made in the f early 15th century. Uh, Bramante's Cortile that was done a little bit later and Pietro di Cortona's new nose that he put on the front of it and Piazza, all uh, interrelating with one another. And uh, the drawings of that through the, through the piazza, again, things that don't exist because um, people don't seem to be interested in these relationships until they get my book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. So speaking of the book, this is the book, and uh, it's on sale outside that you can have um, Michael sign for you. But we're now going to move to a, a short Q&A period, and I'd like to invite my colleague, uh, John D. Domenico to the stage to um, sit with Michael and have a little conversation. We can duel. This thing is so elegant. <laughs> I'm glad you're working. There it goes. I think it's okay now. Uh, I'm glad you got to the bloopers <laughs> because uh, Santa Maria de la Pace and some of the real gems were at the back of the list there. Yeah. I had two uh, observations that I thought I would share with uh, everyone tonight. Mike, sorry. There were two observations. Uh, one was, you're such a humble guy, you know? I had these drawings laying around, and I thought I would. It's a remarkable set of uh, drawings. And, uh, and particularly the 
so many that didn't exist. As you said, you piece them, you know, you put them together in this montage, the San Pietro drawing is uh, incredible, and the, the Quattro Fontana, where you see the entire assemblage with the fountains. I mean, this is a kind of heroic task that we now have. So I gotta thank you for that. That was the first, uh, that's the first observation. The second that I thought was interesting, I, I'm sitting here for uh, a half an hour, I guess, before we got started. And it's clear that in the room this evening, there are uh, friends and colleagues that you have from the academy, you know, from the time when you first started this journey. Uh, and, then, and there are some uh, folks who were students then when you assembled this, and there were colleagues who worked with you on this. Uh, and there are students that are students today <laughs> that, are, uh, that are in your studio and my studio and, and, and other faculty that are here. A and that kind of multi-generational aspect of uh, this journey of transformation and urban formation is really kind of fascinating. So that, that that's something you don't often see. So, and, and I guess, and then I'm secretly getting the fact that there's, I'd like to hear from these people. So because they all had different, they were all involved, many of them at different times, uh, and some of them on uh, working with you directly on the uh, material that's in the book. So I hope they speak up too uh, in a minute or two. But so those are the, those are the two immediate uh, observations. Um, and I think you, you start out by, uh, in uh, the book, talking about how you, you really, the goal was to uh, really look at buildings and the relationship to the city as a whole. And uh, that also doesn't happen often. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's pretty admirable. And I know you're, you're like, oh, you know, gee, you know, yeah. Uh, but that's a really important statement to make and to, to put out there. And, and, and I know just as a colleague for so many years, it's, uh, it's really refreshing to have someone that's reviewing a project with you and is constantly looking at a building and its, its, its relationship, its consequences uh, to, that, to the larger city around it. And I think it's, again, demonstrated tonight. Uh, does any, anyone have any questions? Or any, where should we start with questions? I don't know where to start. Such a quiet group. Question in the back. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, I, I thought those two uh, images about uh, the kind of urbanism, it was very uh, Im important when I was an uh, urban design student uh, uh, as uh, the new city, which was uh, proposed by uh, early on by CIM, uh, Le Corbusier was uh, uh, kind of mastermind that whole thing. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, it starts, that starts the CM and the, and the Team 10 that follow from it into this uh, pattern, I felt, that has uh, reappeared in different ways um, uh, since that time. And uh, the deconstruction movement uh, I have the I had the little image of uh, Lille up there, um, where not not much different from what was proposed um, by CIM. Even though we've uh, pretty much uh, condemned or or critiqued very strongly the uh, modern urbanist movement, uh, that it still c seems to come around. We had, I think, one of the disastrous moments was uh, I mentioned urban renewal. I had the picture from. Uh, uh, Walter Gropius's office, uh, Architects Collaborative, of uh, what he started in the middle of Boston. Uh, and uh, that happened in Baltimore and Fort Worth and Hartford, Connecticut. And, uh, all, and, and that, I think, continues today. There still is, and the reason I uh, said narcissistic urbanism uh, was that there still seems to be an interest to make buildings that uh, stand out rather than fit in. Uh, 
And so it perpetuates that, that um, general notion that was, if we find the way to make the new city, we can replace the old one. Uh, and uh, I'm arguing quite the opposite. Other uh, questions? Yo, in the back there. I'm not hearing you. Um, there were, there, <laughs> uh, but like the radio city and things like that. Do you think in a city like New York where we're set up with machine and grid, there may be some merit in introducing ideas of social interaction? Well, I, I think the general notion about uh, let's not take down New York City <laughs> would fit in. Um, uh, to, to make a change, and that uh, New York City seems to be uh, pretty stable in its, um, uh, in its continuity. Although, if you look carefully, you can see there's tremendous changes happened in, in a quite short period of time compared to most uh, historical cities. Um, but I do think the, the basic idea that I'm suggesting is that but if you analyze the existing conditions, you can um, insert new things into it that respond to it. And if it works well, the response becomes more interesting than if you hadn't looked at the context at all. It becomes more complex and more engaging. Uh, so that should be able to happen anywhere at that general level. And you know, the thesis builds on this notion of the uh, humanist Renaissance notion of the theory of the ideal, and uh, so one a question that I think follows up on this whole discussion about narcissism is uh, what where is the ideal uh, today? The world seems to be so real. Where do you look for the ideal? Um, I think you got to get it out of yourself. Uh, I think it's. Uh, I mean, there's a kind of moral tone to what I'm, I'm uh, talking about too. That there is um, uh, the uh, I'm not not sure how to how to kind of put it uh, about the uh, the res the idea about utopia, uh, which actually what kind of fell into decline as a discussion. I think. Uh, probably for the last, uh, from the th 30s till fairly, relatively recently. So I don't think there's been much discuss, discussion about the idea of utopia. Uh, Karl Popper kind of clobbered it with his, uh, his uh, uh, ph philosophical ideas. But I noticed um, one uh, person I'm quite interested in as a, uh, a kind of a, a political critic, uh, Frederick Jameson, has now come out with a whole bunch of ideas about utopian thinking. So it, it's possible that it just hasn't been around and people aren't, don't see that it's a valuable thing. And, and up until recently, I think people thought it was a negative idea that the utopians were totalitarian thoughts and so on. Do, do you think we in the academy have an obligation to be thinking more about utopia? I would think we have a better opportunity than almost any place else to to uh, go out on a limb and and do uh, and you know make speculations. It, uh, but it it does require. I mean, one of the critical things about the definition I read of, about a utopia is it's not just a physical thing. It's got to be a kind of social, political, and as I say, or I think even a moral uh, issue that uh, that things aren't right now. And the, the Mumford quote I, I love a lot that it, we're uncovering um, uh, because we're so upset with the way things are, 
but we're looking for potentialities. It, it, there's the possibility of potentialities. Um, but in the academy, one would think that's a possible uh, research. You wanted to ask some of the people who came with me to say something. Yeah, well. <laughs> John had a question. Yeah, Michael, I'm, I'm looking at the images that are behind you right now. And uh, nice. it's interesting that the plan, especially, seems to be kind of halfway between that juxtaposition uh, in, I guess, it's the velocity of the pizza gallery and the uh, unit deck. One being the object that's the figure with an empty ground, and the other being the context in which it makes the space. And um, that seems to be a kind of legacy of everything to do with urban renovation for a long time, which is to make the object and kind of diminish the context, which I think is one of the things you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And here the context uh, presumes, and we can see in the axonometric and so on, is it's hard to imagine a lot of cars speeding around you. That, that the possibility of an urban space as being something that people share because there's a reason just to be there. Uh, when you combine that with also the problem of the object as opposed to the context, where do we go? Well, the car's going away, I think. <laughs> so, so the, uh, in, at least uh, in, we might not be controlling it so much anymore. It'll be do, doing what it wants to do. But no, it's, it's an interesting issue because uh, uh, Camilo Cite was uh, wrote his whole, did his whole study, being disturbed by the fact that the automobile was creating a new scale of space that was no longer uh, human scaled in some way. Um, and uh, he was, I think he was right. Uh, uh, and and uh, we, not many other people faced up to that issue besides uh, Cité who laid it out pretty carefully for us. Uh, uh, I don't know the uh, the idea. Well, that uh, the critical idea of, of Colin Rose teaching was that urban design was making space and not solid. That the that the the space could be the figure, and the solid stuff could be the def, the the uh, ground, the the definer, um, and uh, that's. So easy to find in in uh, older cities, um, and not just the Renaissance spaces, but uh, and not just Western spaces. But uh, I think uh, uh, in in urban development from uh, basically the the sixth century on, uh, making human scaled spaces until the automobile came along, um, and I don't know how you deal with the, the issues of habitable, pleasant, walkable space and turning radiuses of the car. It, it, the only thing that seems like could be interesting is the fact that the car is under going some changes. Question? Other question? Oh, there we go. Um, From Kentucky. Looking at the, uh, <laughs> All the images that you showed and what the plans are. So I mentioned one of the plans are it's a patio. And <clears throat> I'm thinking back at the Coliseo and, and, and the kind of things that you're, you're showing. For, for the word that used to go around the studio was cookie cutter cities, right? Where the, where the volume and the void could shift that around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, buildings don't sit on the ground uh, in the same way uh, as, as we're sitting here, right? I mean, Colbu tried some figure ground. We, uh, I think we saw some figure ground to some of Colbu mm -hmm. But he shows the unit tanks as solid. But really, what's on the ground are the POTs. It's, it's really quite different. And it's not. Where the POTs are, it's not an open space. It's not an outdoor room. But 
if you were to just draw it that way, it would want it to look like it, but it, it actually is not that way. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> how do you apply the, how do you apply this idea to things that are that are seen in a contemporary context? Well I have to Well, I have to say the years of teaching urban design, I've been, as so many of you know, uh, such uh, you know, uh, carting around the figure ground as a, as a critical tool um, uh, on making present urban design. I, st I still feel that it allows you to see uh, urban space. And whether it's modern space or uh, historical space, that's an issue. And in some ways, I mean, Rome is something that, you know, I, f I found all these ideas about, but it, it wasn't the, the critical issue. Rome is an example, in a sense, of the ideas. And so f for me, um, what's, what's more important is how to go about making new cities um, from this lesson. And you could say, well, if someone gave me a job to do a office building, which I would love to get, but uh, if I were given a, would I make a Uffizi as opposed to a Unite? Um, uh, I think uh, there is a kind of uh, possibility that uh, uh, that you can still design the void in the in the city, even with with modern issues. It may be that it's different from uh, PLOT because uh, clearly that doesn't work. But the fact that uh, they rezoned all of uh, Broadway to have arcades is a kind of PLOT uh, in uh, urban clothes. Question there? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, yes. From I hope you remember me. was that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Uh, many years ago, uh, <laughs> I, I was just wondering: Did you have a chance to show this work to Italian architects or Italian um, urban designers, just to see their impression? And I mention this to you because, uh, as you know, I had the opportunity also to live in Rome. So when I got your book, I mean, I was amazed by all the drawings that you have and that. So when I saw that and I read your book, uh, it says at the beginning that this work is done by American students mainly, which they call in Italy uh, stranieri. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and yes. I would like to see the impression of these uh, Italian architects or urban designers. And I mentioned this to you because uh, as soon as I got your book, I contacted a friend, which he works in, uh, in Rome in the Comune di Roma. He's an uh, Italian, of course, and an uh, urban designer. And I mentioned to him, look, I got this beautiful book. He says to me, well, is that in Italian? Where could I get it? <laughs> so I, I was just wondering if you have ever considered show this to the people just to see their reactions. Um. Giovanni Santa Maria. <laughs> my, my, my well, key, a part of Giovanni. My key <laughs> reactor. Um, no, I have a little bit. I've, uh, the last two, they, they've been having um, a symposium in, in Rome over the last several years related to the legacy of Colin Rowe. So it doesn't, it, it's still mostly us gringos <laughs> that are there. But um, we do um, uh, have uh, Italian students that come to these events. And I never really get a chance to get feedback from them. But um, uh, in January, I'm going to go and do a presentation at the Politecnico di Milano. And uh, I'm hoping, I would really like to get that kind of um, uh, reaction to, you know, to see. Uh, the, the one that I sort of get from people is that it's interesting for someone to come to a place that, uh, from outside because it's so familiar to people that live there that these things are, are, don't come to your consciousness as much. I mean, I, I, surely all Romans know this pretty easily. But, uh, but uh, my way of uh, looking at it is 
is from an outside point of view finding things. And I, I hope, you know, I get to go to Italy for a few more times and find out. That would be valuable. I originally, I um, years back when I, I was at the American Academy, I, I talked to uh, uh, Leonardo Benevolo because I was hoping to get Colin and uh, and Benevolo to write an introduction. Both of them aren't here by the time I got the book done, so that didn't happen. But um, uh, so I've had a little bit of chance to talk to people, but but not enough. And it would be interesting. We should uh, get uh, Marcella to tell us. What. <laughs> Hi, uh, I I talk from an Italian perspective, so I lived in Rome for many years, and I taught in Rome, and I brought my students there for many years. So I think. I really, I really enjoyed, I really loved the drawings and the presentation and the work. And I think the one thing that, uh, you know, going back to it, your comment, I think one of the things that emerged is really, I think this, how difficult it is to, uh, you know, to over the years, you know, over in general, to the friction and the, and the, the, the way in which, in a way, Rome has been built over the years based on uh, an active ground and the friction of what's ideal, what's real. Mm -hmm. And this is still happening. And so it's not something that, you know, maybe, you know, again, in 100 years, there will be another book. What happens, you know, from now until, you know, the next 1,000 years? That in a way, this, uh, this friction and uh, compromising between the ideal and the real is something that I think people in Rome or in Italy in general, I mean, or some European cities or et cetera, so it's something that I think is more experienced than something that is analytical, mm -hmm. right? So I think what we see here you know, going back to the drawings, I think it's uh, people that live in Rome don't even have, uh, so it, it's more an experiential knowledge or through memory than actually something that experienced through an analytical approach. Yeah. And so that's why, you know, going back to what, you know, showing these drawings to people that uh, lived in Rome for many years, I think it's a completely different uh, type of um, knowledge somehow that comes from experience that less comes from uh, understanding the city through uh, through the layering, and uh, so an example, you know, Rome right now. So they've been trying to do the sea line, the subway line, for many years, and this is just an example of how we can build the new city. And the sea line. So in Rome, there are only two lines, the A and the B, and the C started the construction 30 years ago. So just talking about how the new city has been built and will be built. And, uh, uh, and it's still under construction because every time that something starts to, again, new parts of the city start to you know, be developed, we know that, that there is an active ground that emerges and creates that friction and that, comp and that compromise of what's there. So, and I think the transformation and the formation, I think you know, from the drawings, I really start you know, talk about this again, this continuous friction that will always be there from what's ideal to what's real. Mm. Giovanni? Hold on. <laughs> of your uh, work, which is there, scientific and historic value, fundamental, um, there is an important lesson, I think, that I always learned from you and that you have taught, to, taught me to see my CDs. And uh, can you hear me? <laughs> but, <laughs> right. um, to look at cities, but not only Italian cities, cities in general as systems of relationships as narrative and I think it's a lesson that can be applied to modern city, to contemporary city and across several scales. The idea of having network and pathways and engine when start something shifts and starts dealing with a different scale, with an outdoor, with a landscape, it's something that c is applied at the specific monumental scale of the city of Rome, but I see that as a lesson that can be applied in entire, in entire metropolitan areas, where cities are the engine that shift from one direction to another, where part portion of landscape, productive or not, are building this narrative and creating this system of inner relationship. So I see this almost like a paradigm that can be applied across the scale where objects like Catania was saying, right? That the plaza are in the city, like the cities are in a country. And I see that as a system of reading and the sensitivity to, towards the understanding of this relationship at the scale of the perceptions we we'll say that is absolutely uh, in always new and fresh and refreshing 
it depends from what is the field where you apply this methodology. Mm. Yes, another question. Um, uh, Michael reminded me that it was 37 years ago I was an architecture student in Rome. Thank you for <laughs> bursting that bubble. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Michael had told me when uh, when he announced this that it was Thir like this. Like this? Like an ice cream Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, or a nose. No, you can't um, see. <laughs> that it was 37 years ago. But I, I think that it, it um, that the lessons that we learned in drawing Rome and actually paying attention to the, the spaces um, are uh, make it very frustrating to live in New York. I guess. Um, I've I've sat in on a lot of uh, 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 sessions at the Landmarks Commission. And I'm actually sort of amazed. I, I always think this isn't rocket science, but I'm amazed at how few people in the city, how few architects are actually able to do a building in a context without it being a horror. And um, uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm not that. Uh, I mean, there are modern buildings in the city, a few of them, that have done, been inserted really beautifully. But I mean, is is the problem that we're not working for the Pope? We're working for venal developers. <laughs> is the problem that the scale is too big? I mean, I think it's not just the automobile because, um, you know, the, the the New York City was designed before the automobile, and and uh, you know the blocks are there, and it hasn't changed that dramatically. It's just gotten a lot bigger and a lot glassier and clunkier. So I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. <laughs> in, well, I, no, I was th thinking about uh, some of the the parts you were mentioning, and I, I'm not sure what to say other than the fact that an awful lot of of what um, in pursuing this book has always been connected to teaching and doing new projects. So I, I've had trouble with the landmarks too. <laughs> so I I, uh, I know that um, uh, you, you can't just say that uh, people aren't educated enough. And I don't think it was so easy to work for the popes either. <laughs> I got a feeling that wasn't uh, uh, a simple task. So I'm I'm not sure how to answer your question other than the fact that. Um, uh, I, I talk about this same stuff when I'm teaching uh, present urban design projects uh, in New York City, where we mostly do, most of our urban design projects are in the city. And, and it, it seems that you can go to Red Hook or Sunset Park and, uh, you know, Brooklyn Navy Yard we're doing now. And we got some great figure grounds cooking last week, so. <laughs> it's, uh, so, but I, it would be awfully nice for me if this starts a kind of conversation about uh, th thinking about the city in, in different ways. I think the, uh, the issue of contextualism has been around for quite a while. And, uh, uh, but, but kind of under the, rather quietly, not, not so, uh, out in the open, particularly in the profession and, and the people that are doing urban design. Uh, and I kind of wonder why that's the case, too. Uh, but the, it, it may go back a little bit to this problem that I feel has kind of taken on everybody for, for quite some time, since modern times, the, the, um, uh, the modern uh, kind of urban ethos has gone in a very different way. And it's still there very strongly. I mean, people say, oh, yes, Colin Rowe, that's great stuff, but I'm, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
Thanks, uh, thanks for that, that presentation. And um, I wish, I wish, you know, ten years ago, I had, I had um, heard this talk because I think my own, uh, my own city planning lecture on on uh, on uh, on the Renaissance city has been very much enhanced by this. If there's one, um, you know, uh, you know, clearly, I think that that one of the really fascinating questions that, that, that your project and your work raises for me is that it seems to me that you still you feel very invested in trying to um, reconcile in the context of your own work as an architect modernism on the one hand with humanism on the other and in that sense I, I kind of see your work as kind of being in dialogue with the work of people like Corbusier after World War II um, and is thinking about the modular but also Witkover's uh, work and trying to draw attention to questions of, of proportion. If you think that there's one um, thing that um, ought to be re recuperated or rehabilitated um, uh, from the case studies that you examine in the context of your work, what might that be today for an architect? Is there a particular lesson or a particular set of lessons that are worthy of revisiting and recuperating for the contemporary architect or urban designer? Oh, I think hopefully there's, there's several. Um, one is just a possible re-engagement with the concept of utopia and what it what it it means um, that we were sort of talking about earlier um, uh, that seems to kind of come and go and in, in, at different times and and it's also a topic which is not just uh, uh, for urbanists or even architects it's that concept is you know philosophical in a sense so uh, I I think I. I been interested in the fact that, um, and maybe enjoying the fact that it took me so long to write the book, that that topic seems to be coming around again. <laughs> um, so I think that uh, that's one very general issue that could happen. Um, the other is, I believe, the, the argument uh, for contextualism is very sound. Um, it's been kind of picked up in different places in different ways. Uh, the the new ur urbanists have sort of latched on to um, Colin Rowe, but I think for for rather strange reasons um, that um, uh, would need some examination of care more careful definition of, of what contextualism might mean. Uh, so I I think that's a a topic that. Um, uh, it'd be nice to see um, entertained uh, more, particularly in the area of urban design. There's a there's a real schism, I think, between wh what we teach in urban design and sort of what gets what happens um, in a lot of kind of public-private developer stuff. But um, but there are people like Rob Lane, the RPA, that are still I think looking at the the city in those those terms about uh, uh, of uh, maintaining its its historical condition, but reevaluating it in terms of new needs um, and expanding the whole possibility of contextualism at the regional scale, because presumably that would be a no-brainer. Um, but there's not much. Discussion about that in uh, uh, in landscape urbanism and and so forth. So I, I do think there's several topics that I hope would come out of this because I don't think they're just mine. I think they're around in other other places too. I don't think I invented anything too startling. It's uh, it's uh, coming from analyzing things. It was there. I just picked it up. There he goes again. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much for the uh, book.